to know that uh, one of the developers uh, of the predecessor, the Mix Networks, he worked here in the 90s, uh, exactly here. So. <coughs> Thank you. So hi, um, I'm going to talk about the Toa Amiga Router today, but I just want to make clear I'm, I don't work for Toa, um, I'm an enthusiast, I am a board member who runs service for every day in the, the, the Netherlands. So I know I'm, I know a bit about Tor, but if you are going to ask me really technical questions about Tor, then I probably can't answer those. So, okay. <laughs> ah, okay. So who am I? So my name is Peter van Bergen. I do a bunch of things. I'm a big and and unlimited and privacy enthusiast. Um, I don't see most of my slides in this. So I'm a block member of um, Hot for Internet Freiheit, uh, which basically if you translate it to English, it's Hot for Internet Freedom. And like I said before, we run a bunch of Tor relays, like um, also the notable things are the exit nodes, which sometimes generate a bit of abuse complaints from various people around the world, because sometimes they run um, very special traffic on the server. Um, so we created a foundation for that, and I'll get into that later. Um, just to protect uh, the people who are run these three days and kind of centralize it a bit. Um, that's my PTP fingerprint, uh, which you can find online as well. If you ever want to email me about something, uh, I encourage you to use the encrypted email. So, what is this Tor thing on which I'm going to talk about today? So, this is a graphic, and like, there's another graphic which is more up to date, but this is a graphic from um, half of August. And it kind of shows that it goes up and down, and um, the entire Tor network has about 500,000 to 1 million users. Um, it's kind of hard to measure the exact amount of users uh, on how, because it's a privacy network and a mixed network. Um, so these are people from around the world who make use of it. Um, a various, very diverse audience who uh, make use of this entire network. So what is more interesting is, this is the current graphic. And this isn't because of the Snowden revelations, but because of some person thought it was a good idea to place <coughs> this entire botnet in the Tor network. <laughs> it still works, which is quite surprising. Um, so we went from half a million users to about 4 million users in total. So we kind of have 4,000 relays from around the world. Um, so 4,000 relays from various connection speeds from 10 Mbit to 100 Mbit to 1 gig to higher. Um, kind of like runs this entire botnet. And you can't really take it down because if you're going to blacklist the Tor hidden services, which I'll talk about later what that exactly is, the entire network will saturate and it will break down. So if any of you know the people who run this, I would ask you to play somewhere else, like do something with PTP fast flux kind of things, be innovative. Um, so this Tor thing, um, it's kind of interesting because you would guess like, you know, you kind of hear two stories most of the time that either really bad people make use of the network or it's the activists in Iran and Syria and um, China. Well, this is true. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that the FBI also uses it and law enforcement and businesses who want to look at their competitors and what they are doing. So you have this entire mixed network of various audiences where various users for it. And this is what makes it so, what, what makes the, uh, the privacy of, the of this diverse audience so great. 
because you don't only have activists, because if only activists would use it, you know, they would say, oh, you are using Tor, so you must be an activist, so it's easier to target you. No, it's a, it's a bunch of, of people. So we have kind of like the, the business people um, who maybe say that it's network security or they are in uh, whatever place in the world and then the VPNs are banned there, like in China, although Tor most of the time is also banned in China. So they can escape firewalls or that kind of stuff. Um, and it's for people like you and me who kind of just want to serve the, the internet privately or don't want to um, give away where we are currently located from or uh, doing the or browsing the internet or um, retrieving our email from. And the governments also do it because you know it's law enforcement and it, if law enforcement goes with their own IP kind of block to some website <coughs> and like oh the law enforcement visited my website you know why but if they do it through Tor you know I would think oh great I'm helping somebody um, and somebody who's using Tor is, is browsing to my website, so that's great. Um, and then we have the human rights uh, people who, you know, in, in Iran, in China, and in Syria, and <coughs> other places around the world, make use of this um, software to not get killed, basically. Um, I, I heard a story from Roger Dingo Dain, who's one of the creators and founders of the Tor project. And he spoke to an Iranian friend of his, and his friend said, you know, Thanks for you for creating and working on Tor because this is the only project that actually saved lives in Iran. Other people who use VPNs are dead. So this is the reality we live in. And this is why it's so important that it's a, a big kind of audience who make use of this. Um, so, you know, what's Tor? Tor is this software. Um, it's developed under the Tor uh, project, which is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation in the US. Uh, they employ, I think, around 30 to 40 people at the moment. Um, they get a bunch of funding from different kind of funders. Um, yes, a lot part of that is from the US government or the Swedish government. Um, if you have any suggestions on how to improve that, that would be much appreciated. Um, also, it was invented by some of the Navy people back in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, we were kind of like we had the onion routing um, project, um, which later Roger Dingodine and uh, Nick Matthews um, from the Tor project uh, kind of took that research and created the Tor router uh, from it. Um, and then, you know, it kind of makes the entire Tor network, which is being run by um, hundreds or thousands of volunteers around the world. So, I kind of want to explain how Tor exactly works and why it's better than certain solutions we saw already out there, like for example. So, if you take a look at this beautiful graphic, um, this kind of like mimics um, some commercial proxy provider, say a VPN provider, where you um, buy a VPN from for like five euros a month, you get a bunch of traffic. So, basically, what it does is that you have like a bunch of people who connect to one relay and kind of like access to this same relay. So there isn't a bunch of IP addresses or it's kind of like an IP block, so it's very easy to not do some traffic, uh, tra uh, traffic analysis on it. Um, so this is how that works. And it's a kind of like simple design. It works for most of the other things. If you are not so keen on, let's say, for example, privacy of where you're exactly located from where you're connected to, because we have data retention. Um, but, Let's say if it's a, an EVO relay or it has been compromised in what, the, what sort of way you think that you are private, but you are actually not. Because the private relay or the, the EVO relay is going to um, block all the destinations where everyone is connecting from and connecting to. People can pass that on to law enforcement or uh, any private company or other cyber criminals or whatever. That's a single point of failure. And then next to that, you kind of have like a timing analysis which uh, people could do from ISPs or law enforcement where they give them requests for that, is that they can match where everyone is connecting from and to through this entire relay because we have data retention. Um, so it can match the sources and the, net and the destinations. So those are kind of like the, um, the single points of failure, say VPNs kind of stuff. So if we look at Tor, you know, you have kind of like this entire big Tor network. And you kind of like, you come onto the Tor network, 
you go through a middle relay, you exit at the relay, and then it goes to the internet and <coughs> map back. Um, so basically what it does is that Alice wants to connect to Bob uh, through the Tor network, and it kind of hops through three various relays which are being run by people from all around the world. So kind of like we are here in Amsterdam and we want to connect to the server from Bob, let's say somewhere in Stockholm. So we kind of like go from the Netherlands to London to Berlin, um, to Switzerland, and from Switzerland it goes to Stockholm and then the entire path back. So it kind of like various hubs from around the world, and sometimes these are even bigger. <coughs> so what's great about this is that probably all one, like the first node, knows that it's this certain person wants to connect to Bob. Well, it kind of like sees that it's trying to connect to the Tor network, but it doesn't know where it exactly is going to or what the next hub is. <coughs> and the same thing goes for the last hub, which is kind of like the exit node, where the traffic exits from the Tor <coughs> network to the clear net, the, the internet. So these nodes kind of like know that someone is trying to contact someone, but it doesn't know the entire path of where the connection was coming from. And then, because it's like, you know, the Tor has like the, the onion logo, and it kind of like works like this, is that Alice connects to the first relay, and it still has like three layers of encryption, and for every node connects, uh, decrypts kind of like one layer of the encryption, so it's kind of like the onion, is that it kind of like strips away a layer of every node it passes, um, until like the last node, and then it only um, has three layers and it has been entirely decrypted and it goes to the internet. So, the Tor network. So the Tor network nearly has like around 4,000 relays and these are kind of like middle relays and exit relays. Um, so, these are being run by a various range of volunteer uh, around the world, and also some organizations, uh, most notable the TorService.net organization. Um, <coughs> they are kind of like now an umbrella organization for various other organizations from around Europe and the world. Uh, we are also part of that, from Fox Internet Freiheit. And there's one in the US, um, which is called Noise Store. There's one in Germany, which is called Swagelfreunde. Um, but that's a bit of an issue there, is that Torstone.net at some point ran about 50% of the exit capacity of all the Tor network. So it's kind of like hard if this person gets compromised in whatever way or um, is being forced to hand over certain information that he could either break the Tor network or make it stop somehow. Uh, so kind of like this idea was that a few years ago, you know, it was really hard for people who didn't have access to a lawyer to run exit relays because there's been some cases in the past that people who ran exit relays got harassed by law enforcement or, or whatever kind of stuff. So people then came up with the solution that, you know, what if you create a foundation that runs these um, relays because it might stop the harassment or being raided at 6 o'clock in the morning um, asking like, um, so we saw that there was this self pornography image going through your server and <coughs> then saying, oh, but it's Tor. <coughs> I'm, I'm really sorry that this has happened, but I can't really stop it. And we're like, oh, okay. Um, well, still come with us for a few hours in jail and we will um, harass you for a few hours. Um, so this was a problem. Uh, so by creating these foundations, we wanted to stop the harassment of certain um, exit providers. Um, the other problem is that at some point one organization grew so big is that it runs most of the exit capacity. Um, and now we kind of have a problem that, you know, we don't want that every relay is going to be run by various organizations, so we need more people who are not part of these organizations to also run relays. But then you're back with the harassment kind of um, story. So there's a bit of an there's a bit of a catch and a problem there. Um, I think that's interesting to work on at some point with the organization um, to provide lawyer access. Uh, so if you can, if you get in trouble, 
that you have access to a lawyer, um, but that's something for the, for the future. I see a question. Yeah. Is it the relay capacity that's the problem, or the exit node capacity? Or well, the exit node capacity, and next to that is a diversity problem of where all the exit nodes are located. Because Germany and the Netherlands, and I think the US, are three of the main countries where most of the exit nodes are um, run. So that's kind of a problem is that if well, the US monitors <coughs> the exit relays or whatever kind of relays, and most of that traffic in the Netherlands is probably also is, is dropped on because it goes through the US and back. So we kind of like want to, effectively what you want to do is scatter all these kind of exit nodes and other relays around the world, even in some oppressed countries. So that's kind of like the ideal outcome of what we would like to see. But it has proven to be kind of hard because running high capacity servers in certain locations are really expensive. And you can't really do that with a bunch of donations of people who donate. Let's say if you donate 10 euro or 15 euro a month to one foundation and you can't really run a high bandwidth nodes in Norway, for example, it doesn't have a lot of access to that. So there's like a cost and that was the issue. Um, so that, yeah. So this is like kind of an image of around 4,000 relays, of which about half of it is visible. And you see that, that <coughs> like the, the bigger the onions are, the more bandwidth these kind of like nodes pump out of, over the internet. Um, so the problem here kind of is, is that probably like half of these relays is part of TorService.net or an other organization under that umbrella. And most of the smaller capacity nodes are either run by um, very anonymous people you can't reach at all, or um, another volunteer, um, which we kind of like want to change completely at some point is that um, you go away from the organization to the um, volunteers from around the world who run these various exit nodes or other relays. So, using Tor, because I guess that's also what we are interested in. <coughs> uh, so there's a bunch of various ways of how you can use Tor. Um, I guess most notable is for most of the non-technical people, I know this is more of a technical audience, is that you have ways to run Tor on your mobile device, like say on Android or your desktop, and also using a live CD. Um, most of the people who would use Tor would use the Tor browser bundle. It is kind of like a modified Firefox, uh, which has some privacy patches in. <coughs> uh, next to that, it runs Tor um, automatically. So you download this bundle from the Tor project website, you click on Start Tor, and it kind of like launches Fidalia, which is this kind of control panel of to control Tor, um, which has proven to be kind of confusing for most of the people, even for me it was kind of confusing. So they kind of like migrated away from that, although it's still being shipped at the moment, but in the newer beta versions it's, uh, it's gone. Um, because what kind of happens that people who will download Tor and get trained in Tor, they will download the browser bundle and wait it until this thing was visible and went browsing with Internet Explorer. Uh, <laughs> um, so that kind of got changed in that it's now um, a Firefox plugin. Uh, so it doesn't show up this thing anymore and it's all integrated into one neat little package. Um, so this is kind of like the main thing that we can use right now. Um, <coughs> if you're a developer and if you would like to help on this, um, something that's really interesting is that um, I was going to say something. Yeah, there's, there isn't a really good upgrade framework available, which is kind of secure and safe and doesn't does mitigate kind of like <coughs> rollback attacks and signature attacks and all that kind of stuff. So if you would like to help on this. There was an older framework um, called Candy, which got um, deprecated because it was kind of like an idea and it didn't really scale out. And then, what's your thing on dying together with a bunch of other people created the update framework, which is um, 
a paper about how to create a secure update framework, which is really useful uh, for a bunch of other various platforms as well. Um, I know that some people are working on it now at the university in the US, I don't know which one, and they kind of like apply this to their PIP, uh, Python Packets um, Manager. <coughs> um, if you would like to have a that, I would really recommend you to work on that because this is really helpful for a lot of different projects as well. Um, and next to that, Tor uh, has um, a partner group um, which is called the Tails, and Tails is kind of like a Linux, Debian, WC, SID, Live CD, uh, which tunnels all the traffic from that laptop over Tor, which is really great because it doesn't leak any kind of like DNS queries or whatever. Um, the problem is that if you want to update it, you either need to burn a new ISO or you need to download it through Tor. And downloading through Tor is kind of like a 700 MB ISO image. I wouldn't really recommend. Um, but it's a really cool feature. I actually teach this to a bunch of journalists, I think two weeks ago now. So, kind of like these journalists are not technical at all, and they created a PGP, um, PGP key using the command line. I told them how this entire thing works, like Tor, and they also learned how to read that metadata from a secure environment. And actually it worked out because Publix, as the talk this morning, did publish their first um, article this morning. So, yeah, it works. <laughs> and then next to that, if you have an Android device, and I think it's also on your iPhone device, but that isn't really being updated. It's, it's being created by the Guardian project who creates also like OGR clients or your mobile, um, kind of like a secure photographing uh, app which you could share with other people. And they create a kind of like a way to run Tor on your mobile, and I use it all the time over 3G, and it kind of like scales well. Um, so it's kind of that like on your mobile device or your desktop, you have, you have a live CD, and Tor browser bundle works on Windows, Mac, and um, our free software um, platforms. So most of the platforms are um, supported, which is pretty cool. But not everyone likes Tor, of course. So. There's a list of the Tor relays, which is public and everybody could see. There's a really fancy website at atlas.torproject.org or metrics.torproject.org. Atlas.torproject.org shows you uh, if you type in the name of a um, relay or an IP address, how long that action node has been running or that relay has been running. You can get more information from it, like um, traffic statistics of how much traffic has been um, well, actually, how much traffic, how much bandwidth you are donating to the Tor network. <coughs> um, and also, there's an older archive list of other exit nodes or relay nodes um, that's being archived because often an abuse complaint comes in and then when the law enforcement acts like, we would like to have the customer information of this web server or this server because it we got an abuse complaint from someone that happened six months ago and the person is not running the node anymore. So you could then say that, oh, you know, this is onion O archive of relay IP ad addresses which you could download and see if this IP ever ran an exit node or, an, or another relay. So there's an archive of other platforms, of other IP addresses as well. Um, and you know, Tor sometimes generates a lot of complaints and a lot of abuse. So some people block their entire Tor network, um, unfortunately, but I can kind of understand why. But this also means that a lot of the sensors can also block most of the relays. So this is kind of a problem because most of these relays have been banned in various countries, like Syria is one of them. Um, and I think Syria is a really good example because it's kind of like in the news. So. Another um, board member of our foundation kind of like told this story that a friend of his got a lot of friends in, got a lot of friends there, and he recommends them to use Tor. And what kind of happens in Syria is that um, people who set things over Skype, um, even like a funny joke about the regime there, kind of like got a death squad at the door the next day. 
So the people who use Tor and not use any proprietary kind of software um, are still alive. But the thing is, is that most of the Tor relays are banned in, uh, on the ISP level there. So he runs this Tor relay on his router at home, and he only got like 4 Mbit up. So he has like 400 people <laughs> going through his small router. Um, I'm surprised that doesn't mean black yet. Um, so this is one way to kind of like mitigate it, is that you can run a non-harassment kind of relay to help a lot of people around the world. Is that if you run, if you have like, I would say, three or four or five Mbits, it's enough to run a grid, and a grid doesn't generate any um, um, abuse from uh, the traffic, because it only has one coming in, um, which is encrypted. Um, so kind of like that is what, what can mitigate that. But then next to that, uh, so those are the bridges, and kind of like a private entry point in the Tor network. Um, some of these bridges are completely private, and um, it's also a kind of like pointy point of research, is that Tor doesn't have a lot of good strategies for the bridge distribution to the people who need it. Um, because often you can obtain these bridges in to browse the bridges.torproject.org but what if the website is actually censored? You can't really reach it, right? Or by email, but most of the email is watched in certain regimes and if it's coming from torproject.org, you can't like say, oh, you know, these are three private bridges so we can ban them in our ISP filters. So there's a, a point of research and if you have any idea of that, I would really recommend to talk to the Tor people. Um, so we actually got access to um, subnet of on slash 24, and we kind of like want to run a few bridges, kind of like private bridges. Um, and then next to that, we kind of like want to run obfuscated proxies. I will explain more about that later. But you know, there are certain countries like China, for example, and Iran, and China is a really good example of that, who doesn't like Tor at all. So there are like two countries in the world that are really kind of <coughs> aggressive in their probing of Tor um, relays. So China just scans the entire internet and search for um, kind of like probes, SSL ports and probes, um, Tor ports, um, because it's really easy to, if you would probe a Tor probe or Tor node, it kind of like shows back that it's running Tor. It kind of like doesn't mimic kind of like, let's say, an Apache web server of an SSL connection. So China, like kind of like you can have like a connection if you have a private bridge for uh, five minutes, and then the firewall says, "Oh, this is Tor. We're gonna block you from the internet for like a couple of minutes, and like kind of like terminate the entire thing." <laughs> um, and then next to that, Tor traffic is kind of like easily observable, um, but this can be overcome. Um, however. Not a lot of people run these kind of bridges. Um, they're called obfuscated bridges. And the difference between an obfuscated bridge and a normal bridge is that <coughs> a normal bridge kind of would look like SSL kind of traffic. But the obfuscated bridge looks like complete two orbits, which comes to one node to the other node, and it doesn't contain any signatures at all. So this is great. However, not a lot of people run these kind of bridges. So we need a lot of help and I need your help to run this kind of proxies. Um, this, does, this, generate, this doesn't generate any complaints at all, like an exit relay would do. So if you have any bandwidth or um, any capacity anywhere left, I would really recommend you to run an obfuscated proxy. And a lot of people in very suppressive regimes would thank you. Um, so the arms race goes on, it's kind of like this you know, you get blocked, you need kind of like you need to meet the case, um, then you get blocked again, then you win some, then you lose some, so <coughs> situation the entire time. But, you know, um, Tor still is out there, and they come up with various solutions all the time, so pick up for them. Yeah, Tor needs your help. Tor really needs your help. Uh, um, I think one thing that is worth mentioning is that there are two deaf meetings, like every, every year, one in Europe and one in the US. Um, and if you would help, like to help out with either documentation or support, or you're really good in writing Python code, you're really good in Qt, or that kind of stuff, you know, 
and you are looking for more work to do than you already are doing, I would really recommend you going there. Um, or help us out with the foundation we are setting up in the Netherlands. Um, that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's a bunch of things to do. Um, and there's a lot of research to be done. Um, there's a page on the top project uh, which kind of shows the kind of like research or things that you can do. And if you're really good with crypto, I would say that it's really, really nice to have like parallel crypto implemented. Because what we kind of now need to do, if you have like, so let's say, a quad core machine, you kind of like need to run four different Tor demons on the same box to um, get the entire capacity from the box. Um, it would be really nice if this get mitigated so we only have to run one Tor process instead of four or six or eight or ten or you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you're good in C or Python, there's a bunch of projects out there, even some in Java or JavaScript. Um, if you're really good with statistics um, and you really like to play with R, there's also a bunch of stuff to do. Um, so, also for Node.js and all kind of stuff. So, contact them if you'd like to help out with something. Um, so, kind of like <coughs> about Tor. Um, so, we came up with an idea to start a tour on this agent that runs exit relays um, and not get harassed so much. Like, I think <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> and then, you know, I kind of think how this goes, and then, yeah, we really we need to do this, and then you kind of like, it kind of flips away. So at the last CCC Congress in Hamburg, um, almost a year ago, we came up with this idea, we kind of wrapped a few people together who were there and kind of like discussed this entire thing. And um, in July, right? Yes. <laughs> We um, started the foundation, um, and we have a bunch of donations at the moment coming up. I've been helping out with the uh, tour service on that for longer. So they kind of got funding from the Heathworth Foundation to um, run 4,000 more bridges in the coming two years, um, and a bunch of more access relays, and this money gets distributed to the various partners under the uh, complete umbrella. Um, so there's you know things going on. Um, but we don't really want to rely too much on this institutional kind of like grant money which we can get every so often. <coughs> we would like to have some, you know, kind of like this begging for money thing, but we could really use some money if you don't want to run any relay, um, but you want to, if it's, you want to outsource it, you know, we are there. Um, um, so, I was looking at the smaller URL work, yeah, but it isn't the case. So it's kind of like the hot for internet try height, print NL, dot NL. Um, you can show that it like has this really small English page, which you only have there to um, help if people want to send us abuse complaints about whatever. Um, so that. Um, I can ask people questions. Yes. I've tried to run a, a Tor Relay yeah. uh, on a VPN, and I found out I'm, I'm not a, the most technical guy, but it doesn't seem very easy. Um, so is that yeah. something you hear more often? Yeah, I mean, the kind of like, same thing happens to most of the kind of like liberation tech community, that most of the tools which are out there to actually help people and secure the communications are not so easy to use. Um, so, the new Tor browser bundle has been a has been a great improvement in that regard, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, the kind of thing is is that you know we kind of have like our developers and we are technical people, um, but we don't really think the same way as let's say my my mother would like to you know browse the internet. So there's a um, there's a problem there. Um, so I think what would be great I've been studying um, another project which kind of like creates OTR software, which is like the off-the-record messaging kind of thing. And we partnered with an, another NGO in uh, London and in Berlin to kind of like try to get feedback from the people on the ground who are actually using this thing. Um, and next to that, you know, funders don't really like to get to give money to uh, making projects easier to use, but only in like anti-censorship um, circumvention. 
So I wrote this before, yes. Um, um, this will improve, it has been improved. It's still in the beta phase, so it isn't really in the stable um, thing yet. But I hope this will actually come to the beta, to the stable release in like the next year. <coughs> <release. coughs> Yeah, well, if you're interested in still running your exit node, you can still contact us if you have a problem and um, we might be able to help you out. Okay. Um, no, not, nothing you mentioned yet. For the, 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 the foundation we started, you can also, we're planning to have this uh, adopt a node program where you can donate like 10 euros or 20 euros a month or less, yeah, or, less. or with, with more people, like 5 euros each. And you you can pick a name for your node, you can watch the statistics of your node, and, and, and you can run the, the node at our, at our servers. Uh, by just paying us a few uh, uh, euros a month. So you get that, you know, you kind of get the statistics back, like you have helped this X amount of people from around the world on a secure internet connection. So, you know, you can feel all good. And but it's quite <laughs> different from just sending a donation and thinking, hey, well, I'm helping you finish. You can actually see where your money yeah, is going. And that's exactly. We kind of like want to provide feedback on what this donation which you're giving us is actually <coughs> costing. Uh, but this is in the works and it will probably will take a few months to. So will you include a safe lives counter? <laughs> yeah, approximate safe lives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this will probably be the case. Uh, Lynx has, has made these uh, routers that you can run apps on, like mm -hmm. cloud routers. Maybe take a look at that if you can actually make an app to install on your Lynx router. Yeah. So that would be perfect. The thing is on 24/7, and if you, if you just give it like a low quality of service, yeah, it, you can have a perfect relay node. Um, there's actually two things I will do, and that's a really good suggestion which you are doing. There are two things which you can do: is that if you have a credit card, or you can get a private, uh, a prepaid credit card, and you go to cloud.tor.org, you can run a tour bridge, an office scale bridge for uh, less than three dollars <coughs> a month. Um, so this is how many euros, like two, two, so two euro a month, um, which you can do, and it kind of like runs on the Amazon cloud kind of stuff. Um, and then next to that, um, I think the Tor project needs a maintainer and a builder for the um, kind of the packages to run on like. Uh, whatever ARM um, hardware which you can find, like Raspberry Pis or um, old droids or um, I don't know, something else. So if anybody is really want to pick up on that, you should contact them. I think probably most of the, the links to things are, are MIPS, aren't they? Uh, yeah. MIPS. MIPS. Yeah. It's yes. so probably even a bigger problem. <laughs> probably, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure on that. I think ARM would work really well. They are kind of like cheap these days. Can we finalize it? I would like to uh, cut it in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think we. Are there important questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to say it like that, but we. It's okay. <laughs> uh, because uh, you have a hackerspace here in Amsterdam. Yes. So people can also visit your hackerspace, I guess. Yeah, they can. They can. It's so in, uh, I see you have all kinds of stickers. We have stickers. I also have tour stickers, actually, if somebody yeah. wants to so uh, please uh, hang them out. Yeah, we'll put them there. Yeah. You'll be a really good audience. You'll be a really good audience. And stuff. And uh, wh wh where is Tagging? Um, if you go to the website, tagging.nl, you can find out. <laughs> it's, no, uh, uh, it's at the old Akta building uh, uh, near Slaughter Fart. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and we have a social evening every Wednesday, which is today. So you can come there past six. There's probably some people there. And so should I if you want, and uh, you're very welcome to join. I'll, I have some stickers here so you can get them. Uh, and you probably have some stores here as well. <coughs> well, maybe right. see you around. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to